This is the voice of the Report of the Week, signing on. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone listening. This is VORW International, the voice of the Report of the Week, signing on this Friday, the 6th of September 2019. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the show. So this is a weekly podcast. Sometimes it's twice a week, sometimes not. Um, But I always try to at least make it a weekly show where we get on the air and discuss for an hour some miscellaneous topics. Uh, It's a program that caters to many ideas, many subjects, and uh, really, it's a free-form talk program. That's what I always try to model it as being. Uh, It's a place where you're going to hear a good amount of things. You know, and that's that's what it's about. Free-form discussion. Today's program is uh, going to feature... A few interesting updates about uh, this program. Today's show is going to feature a few interesting uh, updates that I do want to get to. Uh, I also do have a question that uh, we're going to get to for the next program, so we're going to have some discussion about that. Uh, That, of course, is highly interactive, so I am requesting your feedback via email for this one. And uh, then we are going to finally get to the discussion that I've been promoting for a while. It's going to be about uh, Stanley Kubrick, some general thoughts on his work, and uh, primarily if if anyone thinks there are any types of hidden meanings and hidden messages in uh, his films. So that's what today's show is all about. Thank you for joining me. First and foremost, to the updates. Hurricane Dorian, I talked a lot about it, and uh, whether people liked it or not, uh, I, I say with no regret, too bad. You know, it's something that's important to me, and like I said, it's my talk show. But, thankfully, Florida was spared that full impact. Although, you know, the Carolinas definitely are taking a hit. I think it could be worse, but definitely taking a hit. Um, but all eyes are obviously on the Bahamas, where someone was trying to say that There was no destruction, and I was thinking, what are you talking about? Uh, You're seeing the images, you're seeing the videos, you're hearing about the humanitarian crisis, the dead bodies piling up, uh, how how some people, there's no law, no infrastructure. Uh, It is a complete and total disaster area. Uh, Now, granted, not all the Bahamas are impacted here. It's the two islands, especially Grand Bahama, and uh, then Abaco, right? That these uh, these two islands, and it's tens of thousands of people. It, it it's all destroyed. I mean, it's all it's all gone. So catastrophic destruction there. And I just hope for there to be a a good recovery. You know, it's it's terrible. And the more you see, the worse it gets. You know, that's how it is. When it comes down here in Florida, it would still it still got windy, still got quite windy and lots of rain. The other day I had to just clean up some debris, so I mean I, you know I needed to get that done first and foremost. You can't you can't let that that stuff pile up. Um, but things are sorted out now, and I was able to get back to the mic tonight and uh, get the show out for you all. I'll tell you this though, I was very 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 disappointed in the storm coverage uh, from the media here in Florida. Now, like I said, we dodged a bullet, which is great. But as the storm was paralleling the east coast of Florida, it unexpectedly came a little closer to the shore uh, than initially anticipated. The, The eye all of a sudden moved west, about 30 miles. And had it have continued to make that track, it unexpectedly would have gone up the coast of Florida, and the outcome would be very different, and there would be lots of death and destruction here as well. Nowhere near the level on the Bahamas, of course, but it wouldn't be a pretty sight. And as the hurricane was making this wobble westward, I turned on the radio, 
to see if any stations were offering coverage of this, uh, because things did at that time have the potential to get very bad very quickly. Now, now let's just go back in time to 2017 real quick. All right, yes, these were two different storms. But during Hurricane Irma, every station on the AM and many on the FM had wall-to-wall news coverage. You know, it was everywhere, and you could stay informed very easily. So, I turn on the radio, and the FM had one station covering it, which I ended up sticking with them. The coverage on AM was the saddest, most pathetic uh, I've ever seen for, for such an event. There was one station that was offering news coverage, but it was kind of too weak to really listen to. And the one station that I used, I, I listened to constantly in uh, Hurricane Irma that established itself as being the authoritative source of news during these situations. Great signal. I tune into them, and I'm not hearing news, I'm not hearing weather information, I'm hearing with all due respect, some idiot going on about how this hurricane was generated by the government. And I was thinking to myself, wow, uh, there is that potential, again, if the eye had continued tracking west, that it could have been a really bad situation. People would have been turning to the radio for information as their utilities and power get knocked out. And this is what they get. They can either... When they're searching for updates, and is it going to get any worse, what's going on, they can either choose between the sports game, or some guy talking about how it's the government that's making this storm. I was thinking, you know what, I am uh, very, very disappointed in their coverage, extremely disappointed in them. And I think I, I sat there, and I just was saying out loud, I was saying, man, what the, what the hell happened? You know, it's not like... Radio is suddenly irrelevant since 2017. Everyone who owns emergency radios still own them. Not like everyone who listened to the radio for Irma coverage just died. It's still going. So I'm sitting there, I'm just thinking, what happened to make it go downhill so far? And I have no idea. That's where that stands. Secondly, of course... I I hope that the radio stations in the Carolinas are doing a better job. You know, that out of the way. One thing that I did want to mention on a good note. Uh, there are two updates with the show that I am very happy to announce. Number one. This is a major, major expansion for VORW. Uh, I am most pleased to announce that VORW has expanded to a terrestrial AM radio station. And uh, it's a good station, too. It's It's got a good transmitter power. It's uh, station WNQM 1300 in Nashville, Tennessee, with a 50-kilowatt AM transmitter. That's as high as you can get. And uh, it's going to get this show out to a, a new, large audience. And uh, it's in the works, but it's official. So the show is going to get out there. Uh, now, you know, motorists all across the, the Appalachian region, the southeast, uh, can find VORW in their car. You know, people at home can listen in. And uh, it's just exposing this show to a, a very wide audience. And uh, this is very likely a long-term addition, so it's here to stay, and uh, a huge welcome to everyone out there in Nashville that, that'll now be tuning in on 1300 AM. Number one, the signal will be absolute strongest in a major city, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, but again, the Skywave propagation is going to reach large swaths of the surrounding area, so it's going to be great, and it's a wonderful development. Secondly, you know, I did this on a whim, but it's it's important to me, and it's the very least I can do. 
you know, during situations like Hurricane Dorian, communication in the Bahamas, again, especially Grand Bahama and uh, Abaco, is non-existent. And quite literally, radio is the only thing left standing. It's the only thing. I mean, that's it. I understand in the wake of one of these disasters, especially long term, when you're waiting not just hours or days, but perhaps weeks, uh, and all you've got left is a radio to get your news, but also your information and your entertainment from, not having the alternatives that you're used to, uh, that monotony can be, it can drive you crazy. I was checking whatever analytics I could. I was going through all the correspondence. Uh, VORW and uh, the report of the week. There is an audience in the Bahamas. And I know there are listeners that have been directly impacted by this. Who right now are hopefully alive. But totally cut off. There's many other people there that have nothing left but a radio. So as a result, temporarily, I am adding a series of shortwave broadcasts to the Bahamas. And I'm not looking to have every last person there tune in. Even if it just reaches a small number of people, I believe that if it reaches and impacts someone... No matter how great or small the number, especially those people there that truly need it most right now, that's what's most important, and that's why I'm starting up broadcasts direct to the Bahamas. Uh, They're transmitted from WRMI, uh, 100 kilowatts, on the frequency of 5010 kilohertz. It's a special shortwave frequency uh, that just does not skip the long distances that most do, uh, so it is It is most ideal for reaching the Bahamas. So far, I've already had one airing, and uh, reception has been reported as being very good. So especially into those areas that are cut off, I imagine the signal is going to be coming in there really good. Uh, but this is something that needs to be expanded. It's one hour a week currently, but especially in the immediate aftermath, I think a more diverse program schedule needs to be added And I want to buy more airtime. You know, right now I had just paid all the radio bills for the month of September. And with the recent developments, uh, it it don't come cheap, as they say. This show has never ran at a profit. And as a result from even buying this airtime, I was actually late on one of my bills for one of the other stations. So it did complicate things quite a bit, but again, this was something that I I really felt I needed to do. And I needed to first establish that most basic airtime slot. What I am asking for right now is if anyone there wants to help support this broadcast, because again, this, this might only go on for a month or so, but I would like to expand that broadcast to the Bahamas, uh, not just from one hour a week, but maybe to three, four hours a week for the month of September. Again, so I can get more programs to the people who need it. And because right now, you know, if someone flips on the shortwave and is looking for something to listen to there, there is not much beamed their way. So consider supporting via PayPal to V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com. Again, via PayPal to V-O-R-W. I-N-F-O at gmail.com. If you'd prefer to donate even just one time via Patreon, you can do that at patreon.com slash the report of the week. Always remember that information is an essential thing in today's world. And while it might not be as important as food, water, shelter, and the most basic supplies, information I truly feel is a very important thing. But if you'd prefer not to, I understand. I don't feel comfortable making a direct inquiry like this. I, you know, sometimes I get a little tongue-tied because it's just, it's not me. You know, I just try and get it over with and just say, all right, you know, I need your help to pay the bills and that's it. And uh, to elaborate a little bit, 
I just always feel uncomfortable doing it, so I apologize. But I'll be keeping you guys updated. And either way, if it never materializes and we just end up with the one hour a week, I'm going to utilize that hour and do the best I can do with it. Uh, of course, I should always interject. When it comes down to other donations, uh, l let's say you're going to see a lot of charities popping up for the Bahamas. Make sure before you, you donate to them, uh, just research and just look up their legitimacy because there are a lot of good organizations that truly will help the people in the Bahamas uh, but understand that unfortunately there are a lot of uh, evil evil people out there that will just try to exploit the goodwill of others so if you would rather just go ahead and donate to that I, I completely welcome it but make sure you just research and, and make sure that your money goes to the people that you know are going to do good with it. On a final note, I recorded this next segment uh, a little earlier. Another way to really help support this, if even just a few people come on board with this, uh, then it's going to be completely solved. And while the regular airtime for the next month will be into play, at least I'll be able to get this broadcast to the Bahamas official. So take a listen to this. This is something that I've done before, but... I think it continues to remain a great way to support the broadcast, and it's very mutually beneficial. Uh, now recently I'd taken a break from it, but I'm opening it back up. VORW International is again accepting advertisers. Now, if you would like to advertise on VORW, I mean, it is an effortless way to reach guaranteed an audience in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands. Sometimes advertising online is, is very tricky. You don't really know if you're going to be reaching anyone, you don't know how many people are going to see your ad, and so on and so forth. When you advertise on VORW, that is, it is a guarantee. It's going to go out to many listeners, many platforms, right away. And not only are you going to reach that online audience, but you're also going to reach a different demographic through all of our radio transmissions. Advertising on VORW is affordable, it's effortless, and it's effectual. In the end, it helps all parties. Number one, it keeps this station going. It provides those funds to allow for that airtime to be paid for, to keep this show going, to try to cover some operating costs. And secondly, it gets your message out there to a large, eager audience. And when it comes down to the advertising, there's no restrictions. If you run a small business, if you're a part of a large corporation, if you are a, a one-man team, you're self-employed, you want to promote your goods, your services, your online presence, anything, send an email to me at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. That's V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com. The average rate to advertise on this program is several hundred dollars, and I say that outright because I'm not doing this to try to make a profit. I'm not doing this to try to save up to go on some vacation or something. I just want to get people on the air at an affordable rate whilst trying to break even with this program and perhaps expand that airtime to the Bahamas. That's what I really want to do. And as a result, I mean, I mean, some people would look and they would laugh at me for offering such a rate. You know, I've seen local market AM stations with a small transmitter that, that charge clients $10,000 to advertise, and they get advertisers. Not only does this broadcast go out on YouTube to thousands of listeners, goes out on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, Pocket Casts. It also goes out on International Shortwave on 10 frequencies, almost 20 hours a week worth of airtime there, to a worldwide audience. And every time the transmitter gets turned on, I always hear from new and existing listeners. So there is a large audience on that medium. And third... This broadcast also goes out on a 50-kilowatt AM radio station in the Nashville, Tennessee area. 
blanketing the Appalachian and southeastern United States. And again, all of these listeners can be reached for just a few hundred dollars. I'm even willing to negotiate lower. It's a steal. That's all that I will say. You're not going to find it anywhere else. If you're interested, send an email to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. There are a wide variety of ad formats, means of promotion, you name it. Tell me what you're interested in, and let's make a deal. You're listening to V-O-R-W Radio International. So like I said, I'll keep everyone posted there. Now, here's the question for what is going to be discussed next week. Uh, This topic is taking a little bit of a divergence from what we usually discuss, um, but, you know, it's something that I was, I was thinking about, and I always like getting people's opinions on, on various things. And I always like it when there's a vast variety of things. You know, and, and someone was, someone had the audacity to try and criticize, they had, I don't know, they had some weird superiority complex built up. Like, um, you know, listening to this show makes them better than everyone else. And they didn't agree with what one person who, uh, you know, phoned in had to say. And they were flipping out. And I was thinking to myself, you do understand that I don't agree with what everyone has to say. Not at all. But at the same time. That's what this world is about. It's not about filling yourself in an echo chamber uh, where you're only going to hear opinions and voices and viewpoints affirming what you think and that everything else is wrong. It's about having that variety, understanding what the viewpoints are, and then making up your own mind about it through critical thought. And guess what? If you don't agree with a certain thing, I encourage you to pick up the microphone, voice it, and send it to me at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. Now anyway, with that off my chest, uh, let's go over to the question for this week's program. And again, I would like responses, please, sent uh, via email to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. Once again, v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. Uh, General correspondence and listener letters may be sent to that address as well. So here's what it is. I was thinking of this, and this goes a a lot. You can apply this to many, many things. I was thinking about this exclusively in the realm of uh, public figures, especially politicians and the decision makers of our time. All right, so that's what I'm thinking. I'm not really thinking about this from any other point of view. I am thinking in application to the politicians and decision makers in the world today. Do looks matter? In regards to politics and those who make the decisions, do looks matter? Because more and more... And this is a critique of the entire political system. The left, the right, and everyone in between. You see in the political system today, which you know, if you've listened to enough of my shows, you know I hate it. I mean, I despise it in the strongest words. The news cycle and all of that stuff. But you see so many people that make personal attacks against politicians based on the way that they look. You know, you would see people attack Hillary Clinton um, because she would wear the pantsuits. You have people that attack Trump because of how his hair is and his skin. You have people that attack Obama because he wore a tan suit, because he had a few gray hairs, and because he looked a little older at the end of his presidency than he did the beginning. You have people that attack Baron Trump, because some people think he's tall for his age. You have people that attack Michelle Obama because she shows her arms. People who attack Bernie Sanders because they think he looks old, 
You have people who attack Mitch McConnell because how he looks, and so on and so forth. But surely, I wonder, you're allowed to have your political favorites and uh, people who you're not a fan of, right? You're allowed to. And certainly you can make the criticisms you wish. But, is that really the right thing to do? Do looks really matter in the world of politics? And with these figures being so high profile, if you don't like them and want to make an attack against them, there are many, many other things you can use instead of the way they look. Because to me, when someone attacks someone else based on how they look and how they look exclusively, it stoops down really low. And it, it screams out to me, I don't have anything better to criticize them on, so I'm going to degrade myself, act like a little child, and make fun of them because of how they look, like a schoolyard bully would. Now, because of the absolute cancerous politicization of things today, like I said, you heard my disclaimer and I stand by it. I would like to hear your thoughts on looks in the world of politics. Do you think they matter? Do you think they're important? Should we all just focus on how people think and their policy? Or do you think someone needs to look the part as well? V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O -O at gmail.com. Please submit your responses in writing. Or go ahead, take a microphone or any audio recording device. Speak your mind and send the audio file my way via email. I'd love to hear it. But it does need to be mentioned. I just stick to the subject and any overt political attacks will not be aired. I just want to know, do you think looks matter in the world of politics? Since it's brought up so much, is it really important or not? To me, it seems like it is awfully, uh, awfully vain, and that if someone wants to make criticisms, which they're free to do, I think there's many, many, many better things to make those criticisms about over instead of how someone styles themselves, or even just the way they were born, genetics which they have no control over. My thoughts, let's hear yours. All right, with that said, we're about halfway through the show. Let's go over to your responses that had came in about Stanley Kubrick. We had some interesting miscellaneous thoughts that came in. Let's go over to Ben first. He writes, in the movie Full Metal Jacket, I couldn't help but notice the character Private Leonard Lawrence, played by a very good actor, Philip D'Onofrio, who played a very good role of Wilson Fisk in The Daredevil. The obvious mental disorder shown by Private Leonard was tested in the movie, or at least through the training stage of it. I believe that Kubrick was trying to show viewers that people with these mental disorders can easily be manipulated as he is not treated very well through the training. The sergeant is often seen to push Leonard out of the situations and give him the cold cheek. I must add that awareness of these disorders were poor and only getting noticed in the late 80s. With the constant mistakes that Leonard makes, the sergeant punishes them all and creates group anger toward him. With this character created, it seems like the aggression toward him was taken very poorly due to the mental disorder. When he is told about the Harvey Lee Oswald and how he was a soldier, Leonard must have thought to himself that he may be able to make it through the training as if he is aggressive and has the dark intentions that Oswald had. With his poor judgment he portrays of these situations, he sets the famous scene in the toilets, finally showing that social pressure can have a large impact on anyone but it's the mentally disordered that you really want to be careful of, as it's more of an amplified effect. Interesting thoughts, Ben, uh, where, you know, what you're saying is that there was so little understanding of some mental illnesses at the time socially, where, uh, you know, just trying to act the way that they did uh, can obviously lead someone to their breaking point. Interesting viewpoint there. Quinton is checking in. 2001 is my favorite film of all time. I've probably seen it upwards of 15 times now. And while I can't speak too much on hidden meanings inside this or his other films, I will say 
The thing that draws me to the film is each time I've seen it, different details I never saw before come about or have had different theories on the intended plot or moral that comes from the movie, all from seeing it at different stages over the last five years or so, uh, when I first saw it as an early teen. Each shot is thought-provoking, perfect, and worthy of being framed and placed in the living room. The plot is vague enough to fill the blanks, by firm enough to make you feel intention and direction. It's in my eyes the perfect movie, and it's also fascinating. I do believe there are hidden messages and ideas and plot points and concepts that Kubrick and the author of the novel, I believe Arthur C. Clarke, were trying to illustrate, but I hope they are never truly revealed or shown. The reason I love 2001 is because it is constantly changing every time I view it, and everyone I know has a different take or understanding or appreciation or hatred of the movie. I believe Kubrick had his own, but frankly, I never want to know, and I prefer the movie to be a standalone piece of art without any overt messages, and instead his own beliefs and ideas buried somewhere in the cinematic masterpiece. Thank you to Quentin for your thoughts. Let's go over to Promise over in Grapevine, Texas. She has a few thoughts on Kubrick. I will say The Shining is one of my absolute favorite films. I watch it several times a year. And I really wish I had Danny's NASA sweater. Because that's like the coolest sweater ever. Um, I really do think, me personally, I get a little bit like conspiracy theorist. So take what I have to say with a grain of salt. But um, I, I personally think that someone of his caliber, Stanley Kubrick was, he knew so many famous celebrities, so many millionaires, billionaires, people who were elite. So I guarantee you, he saw and heard things that none of us would really like to see or hear. I don't know if he was a part of anything, whatever. But I do feel like he was alluding to things like the goings on in those celebrity circles. Um, but then the other side of me thinks that if he was alluding to actual things that were going on that he would have gone in trouble from these people in these circles or maybe he would have like disappeared then the other side of me thinks well if those things were really going on and he was alluding to real things that were going on did it possibly like stroke these people's egos that they were all of this information was basically under the public's nose, just right there for everyone to see. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, interesting that you do mention it. I mean, we know for a fact that in those circles, lots of terrible things have happened. And, you know, there's no denying that whatsoever. So, you know, could he have seen, heard, or, or witnessed such things and was, you know, trying to find a way to not get caught um, but you know, try to, to make people aware of their existence. We have no idea. Um, but I can certainly understand uh, for sure someone having, you know, a kind of a guilty conscience and uh, wanting to try and find a way to do something about it, you know. So certainly plausible. So thank you for your viewpoint right there. Gabe in Evansville, Indiana. Uh, he says, I was thrilled to hear about Kubrick. And uh, I want to share a few thoughts on him as well. And with uh, Stanley Kubrick, I do think that he definitely has a lot of meanings he hides in his movies. But I also think that there's a limit to it. Because I think that there's such a thing as um, reading way too much into an author. Which is something that a lot of English classes have talked about is... That sometimes people overanalyze every single thing. And with Kubrick's fan base, I think that that's very present, especially with something like The Shining. I think people read way too much into that. But then again, I do think that he probably has some hidden meanings in some of his movies that nobody's even picked up on. 
Um, I think that he is obviously one of the most talented directors of all time. If you're getting into film, that's one of the ones, that's one of the directors you should definitely start out with. And I'll actually be talking about most of his filmography uh, on my own YouTube channel here in the next year or so. I plan on it. But I do think that he is a very talented filmmaker, so of course he'll have a lot of hidden, hidden meanings in his movies. But people also don't talk about the fact that mo- almost every single movie except 2001 is an adaptation of someone else's work. And granted, he does make it his own thing, which some of the authors didn't like. Most famously, Stephen King didn't like his adaptation of The Shining. But there's only a certain amount that you can put into the meaning of a story uh, when it's not yours, and that mainly has to do with the filmmaking and his unique style. So I think there's a lot to his filmmaking when it comes to the storytelling. I think that that's mostly reliant on other people, which I don't think people give enough credit to the original writers for his movies. But that's not to say that Kubrick isn't deserving of his praise. I just think that some people might read a little too much into some directors or authors sometimes. Thank you very much for your kind words, Gabe. And, uh... Yeah, it is interesting that you point out that a lot of you know his work were adaptations, and that's very true. And, and yes, yes, Stephen King was uh, was not a fan at all, but like you said, he also did go ahead and make it his own. You know, he he took these adaptations, but he didn't do a scene for scene, uh, bit for bit adaptation you know he he made a few changes here and there again to make it his own unique work and i think that's the special thing about it all so thank you for sharing right there uh going over to an email that we're getting from brian he writes i did want to offer a few comments on full metal jacket i was in the marines when that film came out in 1987 and can unequivocally say that r lee ermy was so on point i nearly choked to death on my popcorn while watching him in a theater outside of Camp Lejeune. It definitely wasn't John Wayne or Gomer Pyle. While it's true that the drill instructors of my era, and in the Marine Corps, they are called drill instructors, not drill sergeants, had toned down their language and were not allowed to beat the snot out of you anymore, they were serious players and knew how to break you down mentally, physically, and instill unit discipline. There's a saying in the Corps that all a Marine needs to know is how to salute and how to shoot. And those low-budget, no-tech, emotionally raw Paris Island scenes really bring that home. I think it's a testament to Kubrick's genius and creativity. Well, thank you, Brian, for your feedback there, for all that you've done. And uh, absolutely, I think lots of people have said that, you know, his, his work as a drill instructor... Uh, was incredible, <laughs> you know, in that he was spot on. And, you know, originally he wasn't even supposed to do that role. He was just there as a consultant. And uh, sure enough, though, he was able, he, he knew, he knew if he just found a way to show what he's capable of to Kubrick, he can he can get that role, and he did. And I'm glad, I think he was perfect for it. Tony is writing in, says, I wanted to give you my opinion on Eyes Wide Shut. I'm a little late on this response, so I'm guessing others have this opinion, but I feel the movie clearly depicts the Illuminati and that mystery world. A world only available to a small, rich, and privileged group. A world that I wonder if Stanley himself had been exposed to and wanted the world to know about. It is interesting that he died after the film. Did they get to him like they were doing to Tom Cruise's character? I'm wondering if those parties really happen like they do in that film, but what proof do we have, if any, that they do? Now, and that's the thing, Tony. You know, it's it's scary when you think about it. You know, it's also it's a crying shame that so many people kind of forgot about Epstein. And either way, look, you know, secret societies or not, the fact is, is that there are people. How far it goes, you know, that's to be determined. 
But there are people in the high places that do unspeakable wrongs. And it's just a shame. I kind of had a feeling about it. That, you know, it's already just blown over. People forgot about it. But I, I imagine there are unspeakable atrocities, you know, going on right now. And uh, it's terrible. Thank you, Tony, though, for your input and uh, views there. Dylan over in Arkansas has a few thoughts. Uh, hey, John. Uh, just calling in to discuss uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, film 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, I particularly wanted to discuss the more well-accepted uh, themes of that film, uh, which is uh, human evolution and its relation to technology. So we see, uh, you know, Moonwatcher at the beginning of the film is inspired by the monolith to pick up the bone uh, to uh, use it as a weapon. Um, that seems to be uh, a... a artistic representation of the moment when we as early humans uh, learned to use tools. And that was a very significant evolutionary uh, milestone for us as a species as it relates to intelligence. It's also the very earliest time of, of human technology. We see in the future, we have in, in 2001, uh, uh, which is in our past, but in those days in 1968, that was the future. And this, this vision of the future is one where we have satellites, uh, space stations, um, and those satellites are armed with nuclear weapons. Um, and, and we have HAL, right, this AI uh, technology. Um, and really what I get out of the film um, is that with, those, with that technology comes a lot of responsibility. And with, it, with higher intelligence... We need to be good stewards of our technology because we see with HAL, HAL is a, a, a wonderful achievement, um, but is also very dangerous. And at the end of the film, when uh, Discovery 1 reaches Jupiter, uh, which is interesting because Discovery 1 is shaped like a sperm cell and Jupiter is, is the egg. And what comes of that is the star child. Uh, when Discovery 1 arrives uh, at Jupiter. And most people think that the end of the film is the star child looking down on Earth and is ready to destroy Earth. Um, and that, that, that's the next stage in our evolution, is mutual assured destruction. Uh, if it be by nuclear weapons or climate change or whatever have you, that human, that human technology and that the human evolution will result in us destroying ourselves. And so that's why I think it's so important that we look at this film and we say we are intelligent beings who have amazing technology, and that comes with a lot of responsibility. And thank you for your thoughts, Dylan. Uh, it is interesting that you mention, you know, the destruction of things. You know, it's definitely when I ponder the state of humanity and, and how things are. Sometimes I wonder the same thing, so it's interesting that you kind of perceive it from that human evolutionary standpoint. Let's go over to my hell in Ohio with a few thoughts on 2001 A Space Odyssey as well. Hey, Report of the Week. My name is Mihail Nakoff, and just wanted to tell you my feedback about the movies. I think HAL 2001 A Space Odyssey, he was kind of trying to warn us that technology may isolate us. That is why I think that when they were out in space like that, they were isolated, cut off pretty much from everything. And the technology, you know, of how just got corrupted and tried to take over and destroy the humankind. And it took Dave, you know, to do things to overcome and take care of that the way he could. And I think that was just really a warning to all of us to just not take technology for granted and to watch what we put into it. Well, thank you, sir, for writing in. Uh, definitely, you know, you, you cannot take that type of technology for granted, especially AI. You know, if we continue to develop it, uh, we need to keep a very watchful eye on things. Let's hear from Courtney in England with a few thoughts on Stanley Kubrick and his work. This is a really interesting question this week. So, Stanley Kubrick, I have seen The Shining 
and I've seen his uh, direction on Lolita, based on the novel by Vladimir Nabokov. And both of those films, now, he has a reputation, obviously, Stanley Kubrick, and he is apparently partially responsible for why the woman who played the mom in Shining is, well, has mental issues. Now, hidden messages. It would not surprise me that he would put hidden messages within his films. Now, as a writer myself, I know he's not a writer, but, you know, I, when I write, there is places where you hide certain things and you want people to find them. And given that he was the director, I can imagine he probably set up the scenes in a way that would make people question things or think different things or that he just put it in for the sake of it, you know. For example, if, you know, not to spoil anybody, but at the end of The Shining, you know, the picture where um, Jack is in that old picture, you know, was he a ghost, was he not? You know, and I know that was part of the book, but it's a case of actually bringing it to screen and having the director do certain things and it's played out differently than it would be in a book because you see it. So I don't know specifically about hidden meanings in his films, you know, but I do suspect there would be, like, you know, little breadcrumbs as to different scenarios or things that Kubrick took on himself because he was such a big personality that, you know, he would decide certain things that probably wouldn't be in a book, but he just put in the film because he wanted to or he thought it would make it look a lot better. So it really wouldn't surprise me if he did that. And I definitely think he did. There was no way that the films are just the films. You know, it's an art, it's a skill, so... It has to be a hidden meaning or there has to be some allusion to something else and you get the picture. Mm -hmm. I I agree with you there. This goes down, of course, to writing, of course. Uh, And, you know, it also has that... It it carries over to, to film where you definitely want to try to convey uh, let's say two messages at once and yeah you know sprinkle those things in there i i understand uh, you know when i write my short stories and granted i haven't really published any of them probably gonna just make a compendium of them uh, you know it has the direct meaning and then it also has a few more messages in there as well uh you know maybe some points that i try to raise about one thing or the other and uh oh absolutely I think I think Kubrick did many of the same things. So thank you. That was Courtney in England. Now, one film that we haven't really brought up uh, yet was A Clockwork Orange. We have uh, two listeners who are writing in about that. Ryan in Pensacola, Florida, says, My favorite book is A Clockwork Orange, but my least favorite movie is also A Clockwork Orange. The deeper meaning seemed to fly right over Kubrick's head, and he focused too much on the sex and violence. There's a lot more to the book. That being said, there's a scene where Alex, the main character, is descending the stairs in his apartment building to find his three friends waiting for him at the bottom. There's a painting on the wall entitled The Dignity of the Labor. It depicts people working, but, it being a dystopian future, the painting has been defaced with random fallacies and cuss words drawn all over it. It was just as I imagined it when I read the book. So that's from Ryan in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, Yes, and granted, you know, a lot of these were adaptations, and we have our favorites. Tim, however, does have a, a viewpoint on Clockwork Orange. He says, I think that Kubrick's message in a Clockwork Orange is no matter what you do to a person in terms of conditioning or punishment, a person is inherently going to be what they are. In the movie, the character started out as a bad seed. He was caught and punished and eventually conditioned to act or react in a docile manner, so he would not commit or act on his impulses. But in the end, he reverted back to his bad seed mannerisms, i.e. A bad seed is just a bad seed, and there's nothing anyone can do except for the individual. The individual has to make a conscious decision to change his behavior, and the character in the movie never wanted to change, he enjoyed what he was doing. Yeah, I mean, that's true right there when it comes down to life. Uh, I believe there truly are people out there who are completely 
inherently evil. Uh, I think there are sick psychopaths that are born evil, and uh, they're never going to change. They're going to be evil from the day they're born till the day that they die. And it's a scary thought, but I know people like that are real. They exist, and there's a lot of them. Let's go over to Sam. In response to your question about or the general topic of Stanley Kubrick, I think that particularly the film Paths of Glory, which is my favorite film of his and my favorite movie of all time, I think has about as much to say of human nature and the sadism implicit in our nature. Uh, it, has a, it has a greater sense of that than probably any other film of his, I would argue. Even Strange Love, which is kind of comedic in its depiction of, of human sadism and the kind of wantonness with which people uh, each other, right? Uh, but that movie in particular really, really, really resonates with me. And I would urge you, if you have not seen it, which I'm sure you have, I, I don't mean to patronize you, I would urge you to perhaps uh, talk about that film in particular, because it's one that I think exhibits a greater sense of humanity than most films that exist. And it's also extremely unknown amongst his sort of, uh, his canon. Thank you. Yes, Paths of Glory. That was going back to 1957. Uh, definitely, you know, his early, his early days there. Um, but probably one of the first, one of his first films, you know, the very beginning of things for him. Uh, and, and you're right, no, not, uh, not very widely known at all. Thank you, Sam. And with that, I will be wrapping up today's broadcast. Uh, you know, we had a good amount of correspondence, some very interesting things. Uh, in the end, of course, you know, people really did focus on a lot of his films, but I'm glad that uh, Paths of Glory was mentioned as well. And uh, one, of course, that really wasn't brought up too much uh, was Barry Lyndon. You know, just the cinematography there was fascinating, how Kubrick was so adamant on just... He wanted it filmed with the candlelight, you know, and that is a task right there, but, you know, he... He did it, but that was a fascinating one, too. Kubrick, though, I feel he was a genius. So, uh, as always, just remember the question for next week's show. I want to get people's input, and remember, overt, direct political attacks aren't going to be aired. So, uh, that's what it comes down to. But just remember the question that I have. Do you think looks matter in politics? You know, do you think it's just as important or more important that someone appears physically? Uh, you know, to look like, uh, you know, presidential or like a politician? Or is what is in their head the only thing we should be focused on? Because we, we live in a very vain society. I want to know, what do you guys think? Do you think Im image is important? Or should we kind of drop all that stuff and just focus on the real policies and decisions that will really impact and affect us all? So remember, you can uh, record a response on audio just like all the great listeners have this week. Or you can submit a response in writing via email to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. And on a final note, of course, do remember, if you want to advertise on the show, uh, we're going out to huge audiences at this point on a major AM station, many shortwave frequencies online. It's a great way to support this broadcast. And also, with your help, consider donating to allow this broadcast to stay on the air, uh, be able to reach this new audience, and also perhaps to expand temporarily to the Bahamas to reach those who truly need shortwave now more than ever. And with that, I will be concluding this broadcast of VORW International. Thank you all so much for listening. Do take care. Feedback is welcome. VORWINFO at gmail.com. The next main show is going to be uh, on the 12th of September. Um, but if I have anything I want to interject and kind of shout out, maybe I'll make a show before then, but we'll see. Um, but confirmedly, I'll be seeing you on the 12th. Take care. This is VORW.